Good evening and welcome to this special mental health edition of Doctors on Call. I'm Dina Kleba, a psychotherapist and founder of Insight Counseling of Duluth and Virginia, and I will be your host for the program tonight on anxiety and depression. This is the first of four special mental health episodes that will be airing throughout this season of Doctors on Call. Our program is here to answer your questions about mental health issues that may affect you, your family, or friends. Please call or email your questions and we will do our best to address them. The telephone numbers and email address can be found at the bottom of your screen. Our expert guests this evening are Dr. Douglas Heck, a licensed psychologist with the Duluth Psychological Clinic. And Dr. Deborah Viner is a licensed psychologist with Insight Counseling in Duluth. Our phone and email questions are being received this evening by members of the WDSE staff who will bring them to me here in the studio. Now let's begin with a discussion of anxiety and depression. Good evening. Good evening. <laughs> Hello. It is such a treat to, to be sharing this space um, with the two of you. Uh, you both have a wealth of experience uh, and knowledge and expertise, and it is just a treat, so thank you. Great How, to be here. Yeah, thank, thank you. Thank you for having me. Yeah. How about if you both just take a moment to introduce yourself, share a little bit about your practice. Okay. Um, yeah. Go ahead. Go okay. ahead. Well, um, <coughs> I have worked as a licensed psychologist since 1984. Um, I have done many kinds of work. I've worked on an inpatient psychiatric unit. I've worked as an adolescent um, partial hospitalization psychologist. I've done outpatient therapy. Um, and I've worked primarily with families and children until later in my career when I started working more with um, just individuals and especially the age group that I'm in. The, um, the growing older age group. And so um, I've done all kinds of different work, um, but I mostly see, you know, uh, what everybody sees, the depression, anxiety, and trauma issues. So I'm with the Duluth Psychological Clinic, and I've been um, a psychologist for a little over 30 years, and most of my career uh, has been centered around working with people with medical conditions and so a lot of what I've learned about and, and worked with over the years has been uh, how psychology can be helpful to people who've had a medical crisis and how, what psychology has to offer in terms of helping them heal, uh, helping them grow afterward, uh, helping their families adjust to the changes that they go through, uh, some of those things. So I have um, I enjoy my practice because it's varied. I work in the hospital part of the time, so I'm working with people that are acutely recovering from some type of condition. It might be a stroke or a brain injury, uh, could be a heart attack or somebody with cancer. Um, and then I have an outpatient practice where I see those individuals, uh, it used to be in clinic and now it's through telehealth. Um, but so, so that's what I do and, uh, and obviously a lot of Part of that is about helping people through depression. Okay, wonderful. I'm glad you mentioned telehealth. I mean, thank goodness <laughs> we've had that option the mm -hmm. last couple of years, which is a nice segue into one of the questions I had for you both. Because you have such, such, um, so many beautiful years of experience, I'm curious how, how you would describe what you've observed over the years. Mm -hmm. um, maybe some big themes, major themes. Um, I know. Personally, even since the pandemic, I've noticed some changes and some shifts in the way that we practice. So I'm curious what, what you've noticed as well. Yeah. Do you want to, um, I ahead. guess my thoughts since, the, since, the, since COVID is that prior to that, I had maybe done it a little bit with telehealth, but not very much. And uh, at the very beginning, maybe for the first six months or so, I kind of bristled at it a little bit because I wasn't able to read people as well and get all of the nuances and the nonverbal cues uh, that I would get otherwise in meeting with somebody. Also, a, a large part of therapy and a large part of um, helping somebody, it starts with the relationship. And so uh, if you are able to 
establish a good relationship, then you're more than likely able to help somebody move along their path. Mm -hmm. And telehealth, um, you can still maintain a relationship, but it's not the same. So yeah. I see telehealth is very important. It's here to stay. There's some people who have conditions that make it very difficult for them to leave home and come into the clinic. So mm -hmm. for those individuals, I think it will stay, and that's a really good thing. Um, but I also think that getting back to seeing people in person, at least for the kind of work that I do, I don't know about for you, Deb, but I, I'm looking forward to the day of being able to see people in person again. Wonderful. How yes. are you, Deb? I see people in person and on telehealth. I, I initially came back from retirement to Insight, and I uh, really missed seeing pe people in person when we couldn't, when we did telehealth. And mm -hmm. I agree with you, Thank thankfully, we had telehealth to offer to people who couldn't get help. Um, and I see a lot of people with children, young children, who can't leave their home. I see a lot of people with conditions, various conditions that make it very difficult for them to, to get um, in. So uh, I've enjoyed the telehealth experience a lot, but really love the uh, being in person as well. And I will only do trauma therapy. I know you do art therapy over telehealth. I don't anymore. Mm -hmm. I did not find mm -hmm. that to be helpful. I, I feel like certain therapies really need to be done in, in the office. That's, that's how I mm -hmm. experienced it. Many trends have happened since I started working, many things. And the thing I love about um, uh, our newer uh, look at things are the, the welcoming the LGBTQ mm -hmm. community and, and oh, this whole area which I'm not well trained in but I you know there's just many new areas that we're looking mm -hmm. at and just uh, you know a, any number of things that are so not what we used to do and, and I, I also agree with the whole new medication um, types of um, uh, interventions that mm. have really helped people and so I, I'm just loving the changes. Wonderful. And speaking of medications, Deb, I'll, I'll have you um, respond to our first question. Can you discuss weight gain after taking an antidepressant? What types of medications cause weight gain? And if you have to take them, what do you do about it? Well, Doug. <laughs> um, well, I think that uh, weight gain is is sometimes associated with medication. It's not something that I'm familiar with that occurs mm -hmm. across to everyone that takes a particular medicine. I know that the uh, SSRIs, which is a class of medication that's used for treatment of anxiety and depression in some people, uh, can cause some weight gain. Um, and I've certainly talked to some clients about that. There are some anti-seizure medications that are used to help stabilize um, mood that can sometimes cause an increase in, in weight as well. And so the first step is to be aware that that's a possibility and if there's a weight gain, uh, it may be due to the medicine, it may not. Uh, sometimes people gain weight because they're getting depressed and they're not as active. And so even though they've started their medicine, it may be that they're just not as active and that's why they're, they're gaining the weight. Uh, for people that are gaining weight and they feel like it's their medicine and they really want their medicine, they don't want to get rid of the medicine, um, then it's really about um, having a plan in place for watching calories, burning up calories, and adjusting that from wh where they were before mm -hmm. they took the medicine. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it changes metabolism, so people need to drop down what they take in in order to maintain their weight. So, Thank you. Mm -hmm. Another question about antidepressants. <laughs> Is there any risk of dementia or Alzheimer's when you take antidepressants for a long time? Mm -hmm. I, I've never heard of anything like that. Now, I don't know all of the literature, but I have, I've not heard. I, I would assume some, some people might be uh, more susceptible to that, but I, I I know that many, many, many people who are older with memory problems have been put on medications, that's been my experience, mm -hmm. right. without any uh, terrible effect. 
But do you have any experience with that, so it's Doug? Not, it's not something that I am aware is a uh, large risk factor. It's not something that I hear physicians talking to their patients about when they mm -hmm. place them on anti antidepressant medication. The thing is that sometimes occurs, though, is if somebody has had a brain injury mm -hmm. or develops epilepsy, for example, uh, those individuals uh, may be at greater risk for developing dementia down the road, mm -hmm. may not develop it, but mm -hmm. they, they may have a higher risk because of their condition, not necessarily their medication. So, um, so to answer the question, it's not, yeah. it's not something that I'm familiar with. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Deb, how are anxiety and depression different? Well, they're similar in many ways, but the major difference is um, with anxiety, uh, the part of the brain that's very acutely um, impacted and activated is the amygdala. Uh, that's where our fight or flight response uh, comes from. Um, and so anxiety has that going on much more usually than depression. Depression tends to be a much lowered state where you'll see people have, you know, um, that anhedonia, the very low motivation, the, the, the body just seems to want to just not do anything. <coughs> um, strength is down, um, physical activity is down, so the whole brain seems very impacted. Um, so we, we worry a lot about um, uh, with depression, uh, the suicidal thinking, which is is quite common, and so of course, that's yeah. a, a primary targeted area. Um, you can have depression m with mixed anxiety, and then you've got the both. You've got mm -hmm. the the high activation, and then the low, the dipping, and that's not necessarily to be confused with any bipolar mm. type of disorder. Mm. It just can happen that people have both. Mm. Um, but there is somewhat of a difference. Would you agree, Doug? I do. I, I like what you're saying about anxiety tends to activate people and have people be on guard. There's usually fear, uh, strong fears that exist, which changes people behavior, people's behavior and causes them to avoid things or stay away from things that might be good for them. And depression is much more about a lack of that energy and a real slowness and slowing down and withdrawal. So there's some other differences, obviously, yeah. but those are the big ones. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And Doug, what are some strategies that you think are, are helpful when someone is experiencing anxiety or depression? Well, that's a good question. There's mm -hmm. uh, textbooks written on those things. There's <laughs> quite a few. Possible. Um, I, I really, my, my preference is that I really think that good intervention starts with good assessment. Mm -hmm. So I really think that any clinician out there who is looking to treat and any uh, client or patient who is looking to get help really needs to invest some time to begin with about getting to know their clinician and vice versa because one person's depression isn't another. And mm -hmm. so I might interact with or intervene with one person um, and primarily focus in on the fact that they are highly self-critical and that they never feel like they can do anything well. Uh, but there might be somebody else who is depressed that has a good confidence level and they believe in themselves, but they just can't motivate themselves to do anything or that they tend to um, not eat well or not sleep well. So everyone's depression can present a little bit differently. So it begins with getting to know the person and having them get to know their treating clinician well and what their strengths are and what they offer and, and coming up with a good plan. Great. Um, and anxiety and depression are treated yeah. somewhat differently. Um, but the, what, what I have learned over the years, to go back to your question a long mm -hmm. time ago, is that I think that we've realized that um, treatment for most mental health conditions, especially these two, really does begin with getting people physically active. Mm -hmm. um, there is some good evidence that by just moving our bodies that it changes the chemistry in our body so that it helps to ward off or reduce depression and anxiety. Mm -hmm. And so um, even before getting into other kinds of therapy, it's about how much are you moving? When are you moving? Mm -hmm. Let's get you going a little bit more because mm -hmm. that's going to help whatever yeah. we do. I love that you say that. Just this morning I listened to Dr. Kelly McGonigal 
and she has a new book out, The Joy of Movement. Uh, she has a popular TED Talk, and mm -hmm. uh, UWS here actually just had her um, come in and do an event for the community. Great. It was virtual, of course, but it was beautiful, and, uh, and the research, I mean, behind it is just, I've always mm -hmm. felt passionate about movement and supporting mm -hmm. yeah. my clients around movement, but as little as two minutes a day, right. if you could just get, you know, mm -hmm. if you can get a little bit, so I love that you said that. Yeah. And as far as working with a clinician, when, Deb, when would you say that someone should reach out for help? Like, how do I know that I need the help of a therapist or someone else on this journey? Well, people vary in their uh, reasons for coming in. Oftentimes, somebody they love or, or you know, like and in the case with young people, their parents, often, you know, urge them. Um, sometimes people are, you know, told at work they need some help and, um, you know, are really urged to go. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but the vast majority, I think, they kind of know. They've had it and they really need help and they want help and they feel very motivated uh, to get that help and um, it's not easy to do, uh, so it takes courage and they, uh, you know, and they, and they, you know, get courageous and they come in. Mm -hmm. So um, a person usually kind of knows that things aren't right for them and that they really need to do something to help themselves. Um, and they know usually that they can't really depend on their families and or their friends uh, to help them. Sometimes they feel they burden them and other times they just, you know, don't want to reveal some of the things that, that are troubling them. Mm -hmm. And absolutely when a person is feeling suicidal, that they absolutely need to, to come in and get some help. That's mm -hmm. a really big and important one. Yeah, glad that you mentioned that too. Um, what if you know someone in your life who has expressed suicidal thoughts? What, what are some steps? How can you support that person? Doc? Well, I think, again, I'm, I, I hate to say that everything depends, but it kind of does, mm -hmm. and to some extent, if we're talking about an eight-year-old, you would inter interact differently than you would with somebody who's 38 or 68. So um, I think, again, it depends on the relationship. If, if, you, if it's a friend or a family member and you already have a nice, uh, trusting relationship, it takes courage for somebody to pull the person aside and say, I don't know if I'm off base here, but it just seems like you're not quite yourself lately. And I'm just kind of concerned, is there anything that you'd like to talk about and to see if they would be willing to open up a little bit mm -hmm. to you and to help them feel safe in doing that. Um, I think getting the person to be able to talk and about what's going on is probably the most important thing. I don't uh, think that uh, somebody should be rushed into an emergency room or going to see their doctor or even seeing a counselor if they're not ready to say, I, I would like some help. Because mm -hmm. sometimes I think family members inadvertently rush people in and nothing happens because they're not ready to talk. But I think it's important to not ignore and to not just act like it's not going on, but to show your care and be there when that person decides to open up and say, yeah, you're right. I'm. Uh, I got some real heavy stuff that I'm mm -hmm. dealing with. And I agree with that. And I'd like to add another mm -hmm. thing. Mm -hmm. Sometimes people get caught in, in in supporting someone who has suicidal thinking, uh, being responsible for helping them. And um, I try to urge people not to feel responsible, but to have them get help. And, and not be the person who is trying to get them past their suicidal thinking, because that can be a very heavy burden. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I agree with what you said. If, if they can talk to you about it, they probably will. Yep. And I think, again, younger people may tend to not want to talk to their parents or family members, so there may be an online resource that could be helpful. Mm -hmm. In some cases, clergy can be really helpful as they tend to be trusted quite mm -hmm. a bit by a number of people. And so if there's somebody there who they may trust, then that might be the relationship that they can mm -hmm. uh, 
open up in and begin mm -hmm. to talk a little bit. So right, and and one important thing is to to not try to tell people to stop feeling suicidal, and you know, trying to mm -hmm. convince them not to be. Right. That tends to not help. Trying and to talk them out of it. Right, yeah. trying mm -hmm. to talk them out of it, but just kind of recognizing that that's a place they've gotten to, and that that mm -hmm. you know that there is help available. Mm -hmm. And really validating mm -hmm. their experience. Very validating and to exactly. the experience, right? I love to offer, you know, how can I support you right now? Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, in this Great. moment. And sometimes even just hearing your friend or family member exp you know, express that can be helpful mm -hmm. in itself. And speaking of getting help, I think it's important that we, that we mention, um, and I think all of us know, that there are a lot of wait lists right now in order. So if I have made the decision to seek help, I may not be able to do so, you know, definitely within a couple weeks um, in the community. So what are some resources or strategies or skills or things that we could offer folks at home um, that's available to them? Whoever wants. Well, NAMI is a wonderful resource yeah. and it is it is the acronym for National Association for Mental Illness, I Thank believe. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I think so. Yeah, and there's an uh, office in Duluth, and there's an office in Douglas County. Um, I, oh, I think we have, we have the, the resources up too. Thank you. Resources up. Thank resources you. Yeah. up. Yeah. They offer free services. Um, they, uh, I have some familiarity with the uh, with the organization. It's really a great organization, mm -hmm. and um, I know that they have helped. Uh, lots and lots of people with resources and they even have family a family group mm -hmm. uh, for f uh, family members of people who have loved ones who you know um, th and friends uh, and um, there's also uh, Birch Birch Tree Center Birch mm -hmm. Tree Center here in Duluth uh, again the resources up and um, these are our ways in which people can connect with other people and, f and find resources. Yeah. yeah, so the only thing I would add to that, because I agree with, with all of that, would be that in today's age when we are using telehealth, we don't need to necessarily look for somebody local anymore. Mm. I mean, there could be someone in Red Wing mm -hmm. or someone out state that has an opening. And so I've been encouraging a lot of people I talk to is to not stay local, because if it's telehealth, mm -hmm. they can still see you as long as it's within state the state line. Um, so there's some help available that way. Yeah, excellent mm -hmm. idea, thank you. We have a question from the Iron Range, excuse me. How does having PTSD affect the treatment of depression? Doug. Well, trauma is uh, a life-changing event and it changes people in so many ways, mentally, physically, spiritually. Um, and so the, the best thing in my mind is for the clinician to know about the trauma and the PTSD mm -hmm. and so that when that initial plan is made with the client about this is how we're going to work together that it takes into account where they are with respect to their PTSD. Some people, uh, some people who have PTSD have had it for a while and they kind of know how to manage the symptoms. If the symptoms aren't managed then in many cases that's where treatment needs to start before going on to work on the depression. So. It's really about individualizing the care, but it's a very, very important part of the picture to know about. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Cool. Do you have anything you'd want to add to well, that? Well, they can both be worked on, mm -hmm. and there might be some different strategies that are used. One with, you know, one for PTSD it might be quite different than one for depression. For example, the newer therapies, the trauma-informed therapies such as EMDR or um, ART, um, accelerated reprocessing therapy. Um, well, those are targeted toward uh, trauma, um, although they can be used for other things, for li other life dilemmas or, or even depression or anxiety. Um, other therapies that are used for depression and anxiety um, are, you know, they're all really good and will work, but they can be treated separately. So, you know, it, what, what you're saying, Doug, about you need to know that client's um, mm -hmm. style, 
you know, just how it is that they respond, what kind of depression they're having, one with anhedonia, the, the kind where they can hardly move um, as compared to an agitated depression. You might want to change up some of those treatments or interventions. Um, some people will not tolerate the EMDR types of interventions, so you, you've got to get creative and perhaps use metaphor. Um, there are many powerful, powerful strategies, and but they certainly both can be worked with Thank and you. together. Thank you. I think we have time for about one more question. Okay. Uh, Doug, this is a question out of Superior, Wisconsin. I have been on antidepressants for 20 years. Will I have to take them? Will I have to take them for the rest of my life? Going off meds has failed. It's a good question, one that many people ask. It's really a question that needs to be worked on with the physician who's treating you. And it's very important to let the physician know that you wish to uh, see whether you still need the medicine or not. And if you're really wanting to come off of it, then there are strategies, medical strategies that can be followed to help address some of the withdrawal symptoms that might occur. So I wouldn't say that it's a given that you have to stay on it for that person, but it really needs to be coordinated with a physician. I, I know once you start, you start feeling well, same with psychotherapy, it's like, oh, I don't need it anymore, mm -hmm. so there may be a 10, so I think consulting is really important yeah. too, so mm -hmm. thank you. Well, I want to thank our panelists, Dr. Doug Heck and Dr. Deborah Viner for their time and expertise tonight. And for those of you who called or emailed questions, Please join Dr. Peter Nalen on December 2nd for a program on lower extremity, knee, hip, and foot problems, when his guests will be Dr. Joshua Rother and Dr. William Uffman. I'm Dina Claybaugh. For the guests and crew here at WDSE, thank you for watching. Good night.